Well, hello again, and thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy Election Day activities to attend today's event in the 2012 Sagan National Colloquium. Uh, as you may be aware, the, the colloquium this year is titled BITE, examining the mutually transformative relationship between people and food. And we still have uh, today's event, of course, which uh, will be wonderful, and one more event on uh, <clears throat> next Wednesday, November 14th at 7 p.m. Um, we'll have uh, Dr. Fabio Parasecoli, Director of Food Studies at the New School, talking about food, film, and cultural citizenship. Um, also outside there are uh, books from our speaker as well as uh, some of the shirts benefiting our Early Childhood Center garden. Um, please feel free to check those out on your, uh, on your way out after. My name is Chris Fink and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Health and Human Kinetics here at Ohio Wesleyan and I'm the director of the colloquium this year. Um, because my area of primary academic interest is in health promotion, especially as it relates to diet, um, physical activity and chronic disease. I've been excited about today's speaker since uh, the beginning, uh, since the colloquium was announced and since I proposed the theme of the colloquium. Um, I'd met him briefly once before, but certainly not had the opportunity like today to talk to him or hear from him. Um, and uh, had reached out in hopes that uh, he could come and provide some perspective for us on the health-related issues associated with this mutually transformative relationship uh, with food. Um, Despite his very busy schedule and, uh, and demanding time, he agreed, and uh, so I'm really, really thankful that he was able to be here with us today. Just as a bit of uh, housekeeping, the talk will be around 45 minutes in length, and we'll have just a little bit of time for questions at the end. Uh, the, the nature of flights in and out of Columbus to Boston is, uh, is scarce, to say the least, so we have to get him back to, uh, to the airport, but we should have time for a few questions. Um, introducing our speaker today is Chris Brooks. Chris is from Westerville, Ohio, and is a senior here at Ohio Wesleyan. Uh, majoring in um, biology and pre-med, minoring in chemistry and Spanish. Um, that keeps him pretty busy, but he's also the former president and current board member of the Pre-Health Club, president of ODK, Omicron Delta Kappa Leader, Leadership Honor Society. Um, he's a resident assistant and has worked a lot in research labs, which I think he'll mention um, as well, and uh, is doing uh, leadership for a mission team this spring to Washington, D.C. Uh, I could go on really about <clears throat> his array of accomplishments, but uh, let's suffice to say that he's one of uh, O's brightest, so he's gonna be bound for great things in the future. Please join me in welcoming Chris Brooks to the microphone. Good afternoon. As all of you know, this year's lecture series is examining the mutually transformative relationship between people and food. Who better to help us understand this relationship than one of the leaders in nutrition and epidemiology of our time? When I was asked to introduce Dr. Willett, I was ecstatic. I've been involved in lung cancer and breast cancer research for the past three summers, and I'm currently working in a lab investig investigating colorectal cancer at OWU. Only several months ago, I read a book discussing the relationship between nutrition and heart disease, cancer, and the obesity epidemic in the United States, and Dr. Willett's work was cited time and time again. Next year, I will be attending medical school, and I'm considering obtaining a second degree in public health. Needless to say, I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome someone so accomplished in a field that I aspire to one day play a role. Dr. Walter Willett, is is a professor of epidemiology and nutrition and chairman of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard, Medical, at Harvard School of Public Health and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Willett graduated from University of Michigan Medical School before obtaining a doctorate in public health from Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Willett has focused much of his work over the last 25 years on the development of methods using both questionnaire and biochemical approaches to study the effect of diet on the occurrence of major diseases. He has applied these methods starting in 1980 in the Nurses' Health Studies 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals' Follow-up Study. Together, these cohorts that include nearly 300,000 men and women with repeated dietary assessments are providing the most detailed information on the long-term health consequences of food choices. Dr. Willett has published over 1,100 articles, primarily on lifestyle risk factors for heart disease and cancer. He has authored one textbook and three books, including Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, the Harvard Medical School Guide to Healthy Eating, and is the most cited nutritionist internationally and is among the five most cited persons in all fields of clinical science. 
He is a member of the National Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and is the recipient of many national and international awards for his research. Today, Dr. Wilt will be speaking about his extensive and impressive work in nutrition and epidemiology. It is with much honor and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Walter Willett. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here today. I uh, only wish I could cast my vote. I saw the t-shirt uh, encouraging us to vote out in the entranceway. Just uh, for those of you, if there's anybody who hasn't decided what they're going to do and hasn't voted yet, uh, maybe there's one or two people in here, but I, I am from Massachusetts, and uh, we do know quite a bit about Mitt Romney. Uh, he lives uh, in the next town. We voted him to be governor. Uh, he has campaign headquarters are in Massachusetts, so we know a lot. And he's 32 points behind Barack Obama in Massachusetts and two days ago, so <laughs> that, uh, worth thinking about. Anyway, I'm going to talk about diet uh, today. And um, as, as you heard, specifically about how uh, diet directly influences our health. I've uh, heard a bit about your really impressive series that's been put together, and there are lots of other issues about uh, food and diet. How do we produce the healthiest food? How do we make it available? How do we encourage people to make the healthiest choices? But here I'm going to focus in on the co direct consequences of what we eat to our health and well-being. A good starting point, I think, is to go back a few decades to a, a seminal study called the Seven Countries Study that was conducted by Ansel Keys and colleagues from many different countries. What they did for the first time was used a standardized way of documenting cases of heart attacks, coronary heart disease, in 14 different populations in seven different countries. There were about 1,000 men in each one of these groups. For the first time, they showed that there was a huge difference in the rates of heart disease in various countries around the world. The highest was up in Finland, and the lowest was down in Crete, about a tenfold difference in heart disease rates. Other epidemiologists at about the same time were looking at populations who migrated from low-risk countries, low-risk areas like the Japanese villages down in the lower left-hand uh, part of the figure, when they moved to places like the United States, which was close to F Finland in terms of rates, within not too many years, those migrating populations adopted the rates of people who had already been living in, in the United States. And that was a very strong piece of evidence because it said not just are the rates hugely different, but they're not due to genetic factors. And that's important to realize in this day when there's a lot of enthusiasm about genetics, but genetics is actually pretty minor when it comes to determining heart disease rates. So presumably it's something that's modifiable, uh, maybe diet some, or something else in the environment. And that raised the question, well, what is it? Uh, and ideally if we could understand what it was that was uh, contributing to the really high rates in uh, Finland and the U.S., we could modify those and bring everybody down to the rates in uh, or close to Crete. So uh, that was a huge stimulus to try to do more specific research. Uh, uh, other epidemiologists were looking at cancer rates around the world. This is breast cancer. And again, there were huge differences among countries. We found uh, that rates, uh, from, uh, rates in people moving from like Japan in the low risk area to uh, the United States, uh, those populations eventually adopted the rates of breast cancer of people, European Americans living who had been here for quite a while. So again, saying very clearly that these large differences are not due to genetic factors, and there should be something potentially modifiable if we could really understand what it was. Now, there were some clues, both in the seven country study and here, that there might be specific dietary factors. For instance, here, uh, animal fat was strongly associated with risk of colorectal, with risk of breast cancer, and in the seven country study, saturated fat was particularly strongly associated with risk of heart disease. But you can well understand that there are many potentially confounding variables because the high risk countries up in the upper right hand part of the picture there are mainly the affluent industrialized countries where many things are different. 
uh, people smoked more, people were less active, uh, other aspects of diet, many aspects of diet were different from the low risk countries, reproductive factors were different. So we couldn't really specifically say that animal fat was the cause of uh, breast cancer or even total fat was the cause of breast cancer in these high risk countries. Nevertheless, does, even though the link with animal fat or total fat in the diet was fairly indirect and weak, because of this strong correlation, many people assumed that there was a cause and effect relationship. And there became, a, during the 1980s, 1990s, a strong conventional wisdom in the scientific community and the public uh, community that fat was the major cause of breast cancer, colon cancer, heart disease, many other uh, aspects of Western affluent countries. But keep in mind, it was very indirect kind of evidence. Nevertheless, it, that got translated into dietary recommendations in the U.S. and around the world. This was epitomized by the 1992 Food Guide Pyramid that was put out by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And right up at the top, reflecting the conventional wisdom in 1992, fats and oils used sparingly. Those were, you were really supposed to avoid every little bit of fat in the diet that you could, all types of fat. And of course, we have to eat something. So if you're not going to eat fat, by default, you're going to eat large amounts of carbohydrate. So even though there was never any direct evidence that eating large amounts of carbohydrate was good for you, things like Wonder Bread, uh, Rice Krispies, bagels, buns, all that stuff was put at the bottom of the pyramid to be emphasized. And we were told we could have up to 11 servings of those things. And if that wasn't enough starch in the diet, potatoes were actually included with the vegetable groups. So you could have 13 servings of starch in the diet. You'd really think by looking at this, the major nutritional problem of America was starch deficiency. But uh, there, there wasn't any such evidence. Also, a little strangely, it seemed at first, was that meat, red meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs, and nuts were all put together in one group and were told to have two to three servings a day as though it didn't make any difference which of those you ate. And that turns out to be not the case. It does make a big difference, but it's very convenient if you think about this. The, 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 po the poultry board, the pork board, the meat board can all say uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture says eat th three servings a day of X, whatever it is, usually red meat. Now, I, as you heard, grew up in the Midwest, and I know that two to three servings of dairy is deficiency of dairy. <laughs> that you, I grew up, you were supposed to have four glasses of milk a day. But if you really stand back and look at the world, you do wonder about this because most of the world's population does not consume dairy products. Uh, there's uh, very little milk consumption. Uh, there's uh, uh, lac uh, lactase deficiency. People can't tolerate them. In many places, dairy uh, dairy cattle can't be uh, raised and produced. So, it, and yet those countries are doing just fine with fracture rates. Their bones are not crumbling and falling apart. So there's a little something suspicious about that. It wasn't just the U.S. Department of Agriculture that was pushing non-fat dairy products. This was also the primary recommendation of the American Heart Association until very recently. Use non-fat products, and we're supposed to eat all these things at the left, which don't really sound like whole foods, uh, given that you've been giving some thought to, to that. The uh, industry at first resisted <coughs> the idea that Fat-free is better, but it didn't take them too long to figure out that sugar is cheaper than fat. And so you could make all these products with sugar replacing fat. They usually had the same number of calories, and you could sort of sell them at a premium price as a healthy product and laugh all the way to the bank. But, but, the, but were these really any better for us? In general, again, same number of calories coming from sugar instead of fat. Even mayonnaise and almost everything else became fat-free, salad dressings of all type. Were, uh, were, were available, widely available <coughs> as fat-free versions. <coughs> I became a bit suspicious, or at least wondering about this, uh, focus on reducing fat across the board, all types of fat, with a controlled feeding study done by colleagues in the Netherlands. These were uh, Drs. Mensik and Katan, published in 1987. And this was a carefully controlled study 
in this kind of study, you take a few dozen people and you don't let them eat anything except what you give them. So you can fully control their diet for a few weeks and then you look at changes in blood pressure, other physiological variables, in this case, blood cholesterol fractions. And what, in this study, what they did was take people starting off on a typical Western diet, which would be high in saturated fat, and they took out 10% of calories from saturated fat and replaced it either with olive oil or complex carbohydrates. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, uh, the olive oil diet made it more like a Mediterranean type diet, still 40% of calories from fat, but a good bit of it is olive oil, whereas the complex carbohydrate made it more like the higher carbohydrate, lower uh, saturated fat diet that the American Heart Association and the general dietary recommendations were advocating. Up at the top you see what happens to total cholesterol. It comes down on both diets. A little bit more on the higher fat Mediterranean type diet, but a big difference was in HDL, the good cholesterol, and that quite consistently falls when people go on a higher carbohydrate diet. And also on a higher carbohydrate diet, fasting triglycerides in the blood go up. Now we know that low HDL and high triglycerides are related to higher risk of heart disease, not lower risk of heart disease. So you'd wonder, all else being equal, you might actually be worse off on the lower fat, higher carbohydrate diet. The story also became more complicated by recognition that trans fat is part of the picture. Uh, it got, this, the issue of trans fat got me worried back in the late 1970s uh, when I realized what was going on here, that this was going on really behind the scenes. Most nutritionists were not really paying any attention to this at all. But the process of partial hydrogenation that produces trans, trans fat starts off with liquid vegetable oils like soybean oil or corn oil that are primarily made out of essential fatty acids that are naturally bent in shape. And in the process of partial hydrogenation, this liquid oil is heated up and hydrogen is bubbled through it and these fatty acids straighten out. And about that time in the 70s, we were really understanding that these natural fatty acids, these essential fatty acids had critical biological functions. They were the precursors of prostaglandins and many other hormone-like molecules. And when we change the shape, we're gonna change the function entirely of those uh, of these really critical biological molecules. Also, uh, these essential fatty acids are the part of the, the membrane of every cell in our body. So we're gonna change the structure of every cell in our body by eating these uh, trans fats. So these are, uh, if you wanna look them in the eye, these are 60 pound blocks of partially hydrogenated vegetable oil that I bought at a restaurant supply store just a little ways from, down the road from our School of Public Health. And they're very cheap. The food industry, the fast food industry buys these until very recently, they're banned in Boston now. But they would buy these, throw them in their fryer later, uh, crank it up to 450 degrees and say cooked in vegetable oil. But here at room temperature, they're very solid blocks. You can build buildings, you can do sculpture with them, you can do all kinds of things. But the question is what do they do to our biology and our arteries? Again, one of the key studies was done by Mensik and Catan, a controlled feeding study, about 50 uh, young adults, and they were uh, given 10% of calories either from trans fat or saturated fat, replacing monounsaturated fat in the diet. And so if you look just at total cholesterol, you actually get misled. And total cholesterol is pretty useless uh, variable because we really understand now you've got to break it down at least into the LDL and HDL components. If you look at total cholesterol though, it seemed like saturated fat was worse than trans fat. But if you looked at LDL, they were about the same. And if you look at HDL, trans fat is the only type of fat that uh, reduces HDL cholesterol, which is a clue that it's doing something really weird. <laughs> And if you look at the ratio of LDL to HDL, which best predicts heart disease risk, trans fat is almost twice as bad on a gram for gram basis as is saturated fat. One of the other fundamental concepts we've come to appreciate in the last two decades has been that there are many paths leading potentially from diet to coronary heart disease over on the right. I've only talked about effects mediated through blood lipids up until now, and that's important, 
but diet can also act by influencing blood pressure, thrombotic tendency, which means the formation of clots in the coronary arteries, which leads to a heart attack, uh, effects mediated through insulin, oxidation, homocysteine, and uh, very importantly, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction, which is a very hot topic now, and also ventricular irritability and arrhythmia, which is very important because that, if uh, the heart develops a serious arrhythmia, that uh, essentially causes sudden death, and not what we want to have. But the, the important point here is that if we only look at diet on one of these variables at a time, we could get quite misled because uh, there could be other pathways that are counterbalancing an adverse or a good effect through one pathway, or these could be acting in the same direction or in, even synergistically giving you a much worse effect than you would anticipate just by looking at, say, changes in LDL and HDL cholesterol. So ideally, well, just as one example of this, with trans fat, we've also come to realize that it strongly increases inflammatory factors in the blood as well. C-reactive protein is one of the most commonly markers of uh, systemic inflammation, and we could see that the levels of C-reactive protein were almost twice as high in people with the highest trans fat compared to the lowest trans fat in their diet. So uh, ideally, we would look not just at one or two of these pathways at a time, but we'd look directly at how diet influences risk of heart disease or cancer or whatever we're studying, because this really integrates the contributions through all of the different pathways. Ideally, in theory, you'd like to do this by randomizing people to different diets and then following them over time to see what happens to them. But you can well imagine it's going to be pretty hard to randomize tens of thousands of people and put them on two different diets and follow them for uh, years to see who develops heart disease and cancer. It's been tried a few times and it just turns out not to be very feasible to do that in most cases. So the next best way to study this will usually be large prospective studies, and that's what our group has put uh, our efforts towards. The first such study was the Nurses' Health Study, which started in 1976. Uh, Frank Spicer initiated that, and it was very simple at that time. It was uh, focused almost entirely on oral contraceptive use in breast cancer. We, always, we also, though, collected some data about smoking and weight and height and, and medical history. The study included 121,000 nurses. Uh, anybody here in the Nurses' Health Study, by the way? Uh, great, thank you very much. Good. We, almost everywhere I go, we do have somebody. And I, I do want to acknowledge that this, the success of the study is really related to the dedicated participation of everybody who's been in it. That even after almost 40 years now, we still have about 90% of the nurses participating in the nurses' health study. We, we uh, picked nurses because we knew they could provide very high quality information and understood the importance of a long-term study. And that was probably one of the best decisions we ever made. So uh, what we do is uh, collect data every two years by detailed questionnaires, and every four years we're collecting data on diet, and we've also collected toenail clippings for trace element analysis and blood for uh, plasma measures of uh, hormones and nutrients, and we use that for uh, DNA analyses as well. So as we go along in time, if we want to look at a dietary variable, say trans fat, we can look at high intakes versus low intakes and adjust uh, statistically for smoking and physical activity and other variables that could be confounding factors. We only had women in the nurses' health study, and we obviously wanted to look at some major issues in men as well, and so we enrolled 52,000 uh, men who were mainly dentists and veterinarians in 1986, following them every two years in the same way. and then. We had come to appreciate from other lines of epidemiologic research that many risk factors for breast cancer were probably acting in childhood or early adult life. And therefore, we wanted to enroll a group of younger nurses. Uh, most, almost all studies done until then, and even until today, have started off when people were in midlife or older life, because that's where heart disease and cancer is occurring. But especially for some cancers, it looks like the origins are many years earlier. So the Nurses' Health Study 2 participants were 25 to 42 years of age when we enrolled them, and in retrospect, we collected data about their diet during high school, and we also enrolled their mothers to get information about 
uh, the mother's pregnancy with our participant and early life feeding practices and other experiences so we could really piece together a lifetime picture of the experiences of Nurses Health Study 2 participants. And I did want to emphasize that this is really the work of many people, and I've listed some of my close colleagues at the bottom, and I'll mention a few as I go through this, but there are many other people, postdocs and students, who have contributed to this work enormously over the years. When we first looked at type of fat in the diet and heart disease, this is what we saw. Uh, by far the most adverse relationship was with trans fat. Now in this figure, we're looking at uh, differences, uh, changes in risk of heart disease, uh, and here we've adjusted for other variables like smoking activity uh, and medication, uh, and everything I'll show you is adjusted maximally for those variables. And this is increasing intakes of different types of fat compared to the same number of calories from carbohydrates. So carbohydrate is the unstated comparison here. Trans fat, by far the worst. Uh, saturated fat was only very weakly related to risk of heart disease compared to the same number of calories from carbohydrate. And then monounsaturated fat, and even more so polyunsaturated fat, was related to lower risk of heart disease. So total fat in the diet was irrelevant. It was really the type of fat that was very important. And you can see, if you would want to reduce heart disease risk, the best thing to do would be to eliminate trans fat entirely and then replace some of saturated fat. You can't replace it all, but some of saturated fat with a combination of mono and polyunsaturated fat. And that makes a big difference. Some of you have also probably heard about the two different forms of polyunsaturated fats. There's the omega-3, which uh, we often think of as fish oil, and then there's also the omega-6, which comes from plants like corn oil and soybean oil. As it turns out, the omega-3 fatty acids have a quite specific effect that reduces fatal cardiac arrhythmias. And this, uh, is, this analysis is actually based on physicians, a different population study done at Harvard. And here we're using blood measurements of omega-3 fatty acids that were collected when people enrolled. Then during the next decade, about 80 men had, had sudden cardiac death. And so we went back to the freezers, got out their blood, and took a random sample of healthy people who were, they were still alive and well at 10 years of follow-up, and analyzed the, their, both of their samples for omega-3 fatty acids. And as you can see, there was about an 80% lower risk of sudden cardiac death for men with the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids in their blood. And that information has been supported by quite a few other studies since then. What many people don't appreciate is that uh, the majority of the, fat, of the omega-3 fatty acids in the, the American diet actually come from plant sources, not from fish. Uh, soybean oil is a great source, and uh, canola oil is a great source. There's some in walnuts, uh, some in a, in a few other plant oils as well. But those are the major sources. And uh, what we've, so we looked at that, and we do find that higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids from plants as well as from, from fish is related to lower risk of heart disease. In fact, uh, interestingly, most, uh, until very recently, most of the omega-3 fatty acids in plant oils were being systematically and purposefully destroyed by the food industry because if you have more of these in food products like uh, maybe cookies or uh, pastries made from soybean oil or canola oil, and you leave it sit on the shelf for a few months, it tends to go rancid because those omega-3 fatty acids tend to oxidize. But if you partially hydrogenate the oil, you destroy the omega-3 fatty acids, and that prolongs the shelf life of these products. So the food industry is out there using this partial hydrogenation process, partially to make solid fats out of liquid fats, but also to be destroying omega-3 fatty acids. And most of them in our food supply were destroyed. Uh, but now that partial hydrogenation is mostly stopped, uh, we're, we have uh, better sources. One of the few sources of omega-3 fatty acids to escape partial hydrogenation was salad dressing. And that's because if you partially hydrogenate it and put it in the refrigerator, it would become solid. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't hydrogenate the salad dressing. And we saw that people who had full-fat salad dressing five or more times a week had about a 30 or 40 percent lower risk of fatal heart attacks. But unfortunately, the American Heart Association was going around telling people, you know, don't use that full fat salad dressing, use the fat-free salad dressing. 
Um, and people were told, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you order a salad, you know, ask for the salad dressing on the side and you just leave it there, you don't touch it. I say, you take that salad dressing, you dump it on your salad, and your salad will taste better. You'll eat more salad, you'll get more vitamins. The, the vitamins that are fat soluble will, will be absorbed better. You'll lower your blood cholesterol and you'll prevent sudden cardiac death. Well, all that, that's a pretty good deal for a salad, right? Um, there, there are some calories there, so you just sort of don't touch that roll. It's a better thing to keep your hands off of. <laughs> um, another food that was condemned by nutritionists was nuts uh, because they're high in fat, right? And they are. They're about usually 80% fat, but it's almost all unhealthy, un uh, healthy, unsaturated fat, and there's lots of minerals and vitamins and fiber in nuts as well. So it's no big surprise that we and other people who have looked at nut consumption and heart disease, oh, IP address conflict, okay. Okay, so what you can see is that um, people who consume nuts on most days of the week had about a 30% lower risk of, of heart attacks. Uh, and that's been a very consistent finding. So to summarize uh, this little part of my talk, uh, coronary heart disease rates can be dramatically reduced by nutritional means, but this will not be achieved by replacing saturated fat with carbohydrate, which has been the major recommendation. We should really abandon recommendations regarding percentage of energy from fat and avoid pejorative references to fat or fatty foods. That uh, oftentimes the worst thing you could say about a food that was high fat or fatty, that, that's meaningless and it's just better just wipe the, that, that phrase out of, our, out of our vocabulary because it's really the type of fat that's important. And advice about dietary fat should focus on replacement of saturated and trans fats with vegetable oils including sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it, interestingly, we've also been tracking the relationship between diet and risk of type 2 diabetes as well. And we see the same basic relationship there, that total fat is unrelated, trans fat was clearly related to higher risk of type 2 diabetes, and, trans, uh, and polyunsaturated fat was inversely related to risk of type 2 diabetes. Now from one of the first slides I showed you, there was a strong belief that fat in the diet was the major cause of breast cancer. This was right at the core of dietary recommendations. And so we've looked at that repeatedly over time. This is after 20 years of follow-up in the nurses' health study. We have many repeated measures of fat intake, and we're focusing on postmenopausal women here because it was believed that that's where the relation between fat and breast cancer was the strongest. And over 35 women, 3,500 women had developed breast cancer during this period of time. And as you can see, there's absolutely no relationship over a very wide range of fat intake and risk of breast cancer. And this has been replicated in many studies around the world now. That, that is not the explanation for the high rates of breast cancer that we have. Now, as I mentioned, in Nurses Health Study 2, we're looking at earlier life diet. And here we have seen somewhat different relationships. Their vegetable fat is not related to risk of breast cancer, but animal fat is, which suggests that it's not fat per se, but there may be something else in some of these uh, products like uh, red meat and dairy, high dairy fat intake that may be related to breast cancer. So we're, we're going to be looking at that in more detail. I think everyone is aware that probably one of the most important health problems facing our country and increasingly around the world is obesity. And the rates have been increasing now, about two-thirds of Americans are over, overweight or obese at this point in time. And so how diet affects obesity is clearly a, a major issue. Again, there was this common belief that it was fat in the diet that was primarily responsible for obesity, but that just hasn't stood the test of time and, and a careful uh, look at it either. This uh, is a summary of randomized trials that have lasted one year or more. The orange line at the bottom was uh, what we call a meta-analysis result by my colleagues George Bray and Barry Popkin, uh, summarizing mostly short-term studies. And the problem with studies lasting two or three months is that if you put somebody on a new diet and you get dietitians reinforcing that diet, almost everybody loses you know, two to four pounds no matter what the diet is. It's just that experience of a, uh, shifting the diet that uh, temporarily causes a, a few pounds weight loss. But after a year, most of the time, weight comes back up. And so I, the other 
data points are the actual studies that have lasted a year or more. And you can see none of them fit what was predicted by the short-term studies. And if you statistically combine these, there was basically no relationship between uh, low-fat diets, uh, low-fat diet interventions, and weight loss. This has been replicated in quite a few other studies now. Uh, this is one, for example, done at Tufts in Boston, comparing four different popular diets. And this lasted a year, and it's looking at weight change. And you can see, on average, there was no difference in, uh, in weight loss over one year with these uh, four different diets, ranging from very low carbohydrate uh, to very low fat with uh, Dean Ornish's diet. But one interesting phenomenon was that on each of these diets, there were some people that lost quite a bit of weight, but there were other people that gained some weight and quite a few people that didn't change their weight at all. So there's huge variation in the response to diet. And what, from a more detailed look at this, it seemed like those people really st stuck to a diet, lost weight, and it didn't matter what the diet was, interestingly enough. In terms, it didn't matter, the, at least the percentage of calories from fat uh, <coughs> didn't matter. Now, we've done uh, recently another analysis in the nurses' health study in all three of our cohorts, in fact, uh, looking at weight gain, because really the biggest problem is the fact that the average American after age 18 is putting on about a pound and a half a year, which doesn't seem like very much, but by the time that people hit 50, that can mean 30, 40, 50 pounds of weight gain, and that is a big deal when it comes to risk of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease and cancer. So we've done an analysis looking at that weight change over time and looking at many different aspects of diet. The three different colors are three different cohorts. And what was striking was we saw very similar results in all three of the studies. So this is internally confirmed several fold. And uh, one message of this was that there was no one single magic bullet or magic factor here, but there were many different aspects of diet that were contributing either to more weight gain or, or less weight gain. You can see the things, the foods that were associated with more weight gain were potato chips, uh, potatoes, including baked potatoes or fries, processed meat, unprocessed red meat, butter, sweets and desserts, refined grain, and then the factors related to Less weight gain were nuts, whole grains, fruits, and yogurt, and the dairy products were sort of neutral. So it's, it's an interesting picture. It really does, at the top, describe a typical Western diet. At the bottom, it really does describe more Mediterranean-type diet. And in terms of beverages, by far the worst is soda and other sugar-sweetened beverages. These, are, these changes, these weight gains over a four-year period, are per one serving per day. And the problem is that uh, many people in the United States are having three to six servings of, of soda and sugar sweetened beverages per day. So that is, for those people, this is really a huge contribution to weight gain. Uh, fruit juices, 100% fruit juices, also are related to more weight gain. And diet soda and whole milk was pretty unrelated to weight gain. So the, each one of these factors was fairly modest in its own with, I think, sugar-sweetened beverages being an exception because of the high frequency of use. But uh, when you add up these different factors, we, which we did by creating a 10-point scale, if you really had a whole package of adverse factors in the diet and a, that was compared to people who had predominantly good factors, collection of good factors in the diet, then that really added up to pretty important differences in weight gain. Uh, you can see uh, we also looked at physical activity uh, increasing from the uh, back to the front, so more activity, less weight gain, and then uh, looking at our, the difference in dietary scores. People who were less active and had a bad score on, on their uh, dietary factors had about six pounds more uh, weight gain over a four-year period compared to those with a good set of variables. So when you add all this up, it really does make a difference. In fact, that difference of about uh, six pounds is about the average weight gain in the US, uh, in the US population. Now, uh, weight gain is one area where we can do randomized trials, and it's desirable to, to do them when we can. This doesn't require thousands of people and many years of follow-up. You can do a pretty good study with uh, 100 or 200 people and one or two years of follow-up. And so one of our colleagues did a very well-controlled study in Israel, uh, Iris Shai, 
And she had three dietary groups. They were all employed at the same place, and so there was a good uh, opportunity to reinforce their diet. And uh, one was a low-fat diet. One was uh, uh, also a 33% uh, a, a sort of intermediate fat diet, uh, which was a, a Mediterranean-type diet, which was, again, like I described earlier, more fruits, vegetables, uh, whole grains, and uh, less red meat. And, uh, the, the uh, low-carbohydrate diet. And you can see the low-fat diet uh, actually did the worst. And that's been a pretty consistent finding, that it's never done, it's never been the best in all the studies. But it's either uh, uh, not significantly worse or significantly worse. And the Mediterranean diet uh, seemed to do very well. And this study was actually extended another couple of years. And the, the nice thing about the Mediterranean diet was that it's something that had enough variety and people liked it and they stayed on it. And so even at four years out, there was quite good consistent weight loss and good metabolic picture on the uh, Mediterranean diet. Now one uh, area that's received a lot of attention, of course, has been the emphasis to increase fruits and vegetables. And there were some big promises. You may have heard the five-a-day campaign a few years ago, that if you ate five a day, you could re reduce your cancer risk 40 or 50 percent. As it turns out, that wasn't really supported by good data. It was really retrospective studies that were available at the time that was uh, those recommendations were made. And as we've had better prospective studies where we enrolled people and then we follow them to see what happens to them instead of the other way around, the, uh, the support for fruits and vegetables preventing cancer has really disappeared. This is where we combined our cohorts. Up at the top, you see total cancer incidence with increasing fruits and vegetables in the diet. And there's really just no relationship if you look at overall cancer. If we dig down to some subtypes of cancers, yes, we do see some small benefits. But when we look overall, there's just not much impact. On the other hand, uh, we've seen about a 30% lower risk of incidence of cardiovascular disease, either heart attack or stroke. And that 30% reduction is a, a very good reason to keep plenty of fruits and vegetables in our diet. Now I want to uh, focus a little more attention on the carbohydrate part of our diet. And it's been a little surprising that only until recently have we been paid much attention to the carbohydrate quality in our diet. And that's surprising because carbohydrates are about 50% of the calories in our diet. There's been a lot of focus on fat intake. Um, just to go back and review what I think I saw in second grade, maybe, the anatomy of grain. This, the, this is, a, say, a wheat kernel. And on the outside, we have the bran. And most of the minerals and vitamins are closely attached to the bran. Then the germ is the embryonic plant. And that's got a lot of minerals and vitamins and unsaturated fats. But most of the, ger most of the grain is starch, which we call the endosperm. Now, when we mill grain, we strip off the outside, the bran, and most of the minerals and vitamins travel, are taken away with the bran. And then most of the time, we mill that and make it into white flour. That's where Wonder Bread comes from. And we can all, so that's whole grain up at the top if we mill it then. But most of it is refined. We take away the germ and the bran. And then we, at the bottom there, you can see our white flour accumulating. And of course, the germ and the bran have fiber and minerals and vitamins. And what do we do with that? We feed it to cattle. And they grow big and strong. And we eat that white powder over on the right side as bread and rolls and uh, things like that. Uh, as it turns out, the uh, the fiber brand fraction is important, it seems, uh, with regard to risk of heart disease and diabetes. This is uh, looking at risk of coronary heart disease with increasing intakes in women in the nurses' health study, men in the health professionals' follow-up study, about a 30 percent lower risk of heart attacks with more uh, cereal fiber, meaning the fiber from grains uh, in the diet. And it's good to keep in mind, though, that that's a marker of a lot of the minerals and vitamins, not just the fiber that's traveling along with, uh, with the bran. Now, there's another dimension, though, besides the fiber content that's turned out to be important, and that's the glycemic index of the diet. How many people here are familiar with glycemic index? Okay, a few, not, not, not most people. Just very briefly, 
Uh, this refers to how rapidly we absorb the carbohydrate after we eat it. So this uh, is showing an easily digested carbohydrate, a high glycemic index carbohydrate, would be something like that white flour or say apple juice. Uh, when we eat it, uh, it's very, the starch in the white flour is quickly broken down into glucose and we absorb it as blood sugar. And the apple juice is already a lot of glucose, that just goes almost directly into our bloodstream after we drink the, the apple juice. But on the right side would be a low glycemic, uh, slowly digested carbohydrate. This could be, for example, if we have the whole apple. Uh, there the carbohydrate is sequestered in the cells and we, our digestive system has to break through those cells and release the carbohydrate before we can absorb it. So that is like a time release source of carbohydrate. Or this is like having whole grains, uh, wheat berries or something like that. So those are like little sustained release capsules of carbohydrate that we absorb much more slowly. So much less rise in blood glucose, less demand for insulin. And when we look at risk of type 2 diabetes, we see less risk of type 2 diabetes, as we'd expect, because there's less demand for insulin. And uh, this is looking at, from uh, right to left, increasing glycemic load in the diet, and going from back to front, increasing serial fiber intake, so that column in the back there, uh, the women consuming large amounts of glycemic load and low serial fiber diet had about two and a half fold the risk of type 2 diabetes compared to women with low glycemic load and higher serial fiber intake. And the sad story is that a lot of the women in the back at high risk thought they were doing the right thing. They were told to eat a bagel and jam for breakfast because it didn't have fat in it. They were told to have, I mean, low fat sauce on pasta for lunch and that gave them a, a, not much fiber, a big glycemic load. They were told to have a baked potato without any butter on it at night and huge glycemic load and fat-free cookies um, maybe for dessert, huge glycemic load. So that's how you put yourself at high risk for type 2 diabetes. And that was exactly following what the Food Guide Pyramid was encouraging people to do. One other dimension of carbohydrate quality is, carbo is, is carbohydrate, or usually sugar, dissolved in water. This is soda and other sugar-sweetened beverages. As I, as I mentioned, huge amounts in the American food supply. And we have lots of evidence now directly relating that to risk of type 2 diabetes. So this is from the Nurses' Health Study, uh, with one or more servings of a soda per day and almost doubling a risk of type 2 diabetes. If we statistically remove the effect of overweight, then with a dark orange bar, there's still about a 40% higher risk. It's probably due to not just the contribution to weight gain, but the glycemic effect of food and demand for insulin. We've also seen that glycemic, higher glycemic load is related to higher risk of coronary heart disease. And this, what we also see in particular is that uh, this high glycemic load is much worse if we're overweight or obese. Uh, in other words, that gives us more insulin resistance and then in the face of insulin resistance we take in a high glycemic load, it means that our body has to put out a huge amount of insulin to move that carbohydrate over that insulin resistance into the cell. And uh, that huge amount of, um, uh, of insulin and the accompanying high glucose in the blood has very uh, negative uh, metabolic consequences. So the, uh, if women were really lean, though, BMI less than 23, higher glycemic load wasn't a problem. Uh, it wasn't very adverse. It wasn't good for people, but it was sort of neutral. And this really explains why, well, my grandfather, who was a farmer in Michigan, he could live off of potatoes as a main source of calories. High glycemic load, not very good from what we see now, but he was really lean and working out there outdoors 12 hours a day. And so he could tolerate that. Or peasants uh, in traditional China with eating a lot of white rice, uh, they could tolerate that metabolically because they were very lean and very active. But it's an interesting example how diet interplays with the other parts of our lifestyle, there are not very many people who are really lean and really active, that even those of us who might run a few miles a day still were sitting around most of the day, and we're definitely not in the same metabolic state that um, most people have been throughout history. And then glycemic load really is a problem. Now, I'm just going to touch on a few other points and, and um, pull things together here. Uh, milk, as I mentioned, is is recommended mainly because it's a source of a lot of calcium and phosphorus. 
uh, and that's supposed to build bones and reduce our fractures. There's not a shred of evidence to support that. Uh, this is a study of a meta-analysis combining all the available literature in the world on milk consumption and risk of fractures during later life. And as you can see, going from uh, less than one and a half glasses of milk per week to over 30 glasses of milk a week, not a hint of a reduction in fracture risk. We really don't need that much milk. The reality is we don't need that much calcium either. Now, it's even possible that there may be some adverse consequences of this high uh, milk consumption. Uh, and one of the things that high milk consumption does is increase our blood levels of insulin-like growth factor, which is related to several different cancers. And uh, several, some years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist study published results showing a 2.4-fold increase in risk of fatal prostate cancer with three or more servings or three or more glasses of milk per day. And that's been seen in quite a few studies now. So that, there's a lot of evidence, not absolute conclusive evidence, but very strong suggestion that high dairy consumption is related to specifically fatal cancer, prostate cancer, and maybe some other cancers as well. Um, Hip fractures, uh, well, vitamin D is a very hot topic, and there is now quite a bit of evidence that getting adequate amount of vitamin D can help keep hip fracture rates lower. This is uh, from a randomized, tr a series of randomized trials, uh, three different studies summarized statistically, and they show about a 20 to 25 percent lower risk of hip fractures for people who took seven. Uh, to 800 international units of vitamin D per day. If they only took 400 a day, there wasn't any benefit. It's pretty clear we need more than that. What's really exciting about vitamin D, though, is that there are vitamin D receptors in almost every organ of the body. And uh, it's uh, lots of evidence now that higher intakes of vitamin D are related to lower risks of many diseases, including multiple sclerosis and also colorectal cancer. These are findings from the Nurses Health Study. And as you see, there's about a 50% lower risk of colorectal cancer for the women who had the highest amounts of vitamin D in their blood. And this has been replicated in, in many different studies now. In fact, there's uh, five different studies here. All of them show lower risk, uh, and overall about a 50% lower risk of colorectal cancer with uh, the highest amounts of blood, vitamin, with blood levels of vitamin D. Um, I'm going to then here look at a, some analyses that have asked the question, uh, how much major disease could we prevent if we package together the various elements of diet that I've talked about and package them together in a, a, a combination of healthy diet and lifestyle factors. And so to do this analysis, we defined a low-risk group. And of course, that would be someone who is a non-smoker, body mass index less than 25. And uh, we've uh, um, actually, how many people here know their body mass index roughly? Okay, well, that's interesting that uh, physicians, I guess, are not communicating that. It's, it has become pretty widespread that this is a way to essentially adjust your weight for the height, uh, that it, it, it's okay for a taller person to weigh a little bit more than a shorter person that have the same uh, body, uh, percent body fat. So we're usually talking about body mass index and uh, when we study weight and height. And 25 is said to be the definition, uh, upper definition of a healthy range. So most people, with some effort, can be below 25. Uh, exercise, just we sit a half an hour a day of brisk walking. And uh, we know that more is better, but most people can manage to do that. And a good diet. And there we took into account trans fat, polyunsaturated fat ratio, low glycemic load, cereal fiber, fish intake for omega-3 fatty acids, and folic acid, which you can get from fruits and vegetables. And then obviously optional, but we said alcohol in moderation, that's like one drink every other day. And interestingly, of our nurses health study population, only 3.1% of our participants fell into that low risk group. But we could calculate that if everybody had adopted that set of low risk behaviors, it would have prevented about 82% of heart attacks, which is, is huge. So it's, what's, what this shows is that there's a massive potential for reducing heart disease, but even in this pretty health conscious population, we're still, not, we're still barely taking advantage of all of this uh, information. We did a similar analysis for type 2 diabetes, and Frank Hu led this effort. 
And interestingly, almost all the same variables related to heart disease are also related to type 2 diabetes. So there we could calculate that if everybody had adopted this healthy set of lifestyle variables, it would have prevented about 92% of type 2 diabetes. I mean, that's almost completely preventing type 2 diabetes, but yet we're very far from that, and diabetes rates are skyrocketing. We did another analysis looking at colorectal cancer, and there we, uh, red meat enters the picture that's clearly related to uh, colorectal cancer, and we could estimate that about 71% of colorectal cancer would be prevented by this healthy uh, package of lifestyle variables. So if you look back on the USDA food guide pyramid, it's pretty clear that it was really off target. The, uh, just reducing fat intake is not going to be beneficial, can actually be harmful, uh, and what's really important are the, the, the type of fats in the diet. And for the protein sources there, uh, what really is important is which among those uh, options you're choosing, and clearly having some combination of nuts and fish and poultry and beans is going to be far better than eating red meat in the diet. And at the bottom, also, that really ignored the critical importance of the type of carbohydrate. It really needs to be whole grain and uh, preferably as much as possible intact whole grains that are not milled. And the vegetable group should not really include potatoes. That does not have the same benefits as other vegetables. So this pyramid was so far off target that in 2005, the USDA pulled it back and issued a new pyramid called My Pyramid. I'm sure you've all seen this. And there's often a lot of disagreement in nutrition community about uh, which should be the focus of our dietary advice. But this is one area where nutritionists completely agreed. This is useless. It, it doesn't convey any information about what we should emphasize in the diet. Uh, it's confusing. It doesn't say what should be avoided. So that, in 2010, was replaced by my plate. And again, I'm sure you've all seen this. But it suffers from a lot of the same problems that the first dietary pyramid did. It does convey more information than my pyramid, but it really doesn't give people the specific information that you need to make a healthy dietary choice. It's not just putting any whole grains on our, uh, putting any grains on our plate that's important. They really should be whole grains, and in fact the refined grains have adverse effects. So the whole importance is the type of grain, not, not just grains or not. And Next, the uh, protein, again, it's really the type of protein, the source of the protein that's important. It, uh, reducing red meat, replacing that with other healthier sources will make all the difference. And then vegetables, they still left potatoes in there. Uh, fruits, yeah, that's fine, but they didn't say anything about the type of fat in the diet, and still we use a lot of fat, and it makes a big difference whether you're using a liquid vegetable oil or, or butter. Uh, in or um, there's still some trans fats around. We've gotten rid of most of them by now. But the type of fat is really important. And this more or less implies you should have dairy, a glass of milk at every meal. And there's really no, uh, no good evidence for that. And uh, clearly water would be a better choice. So our uh, department, uh, seeing there was uh, really a need for better guidance, put together an alternative version of my plate we call the healthy eating plate. And I won't go through all the details, but it really does emphasize water as the beverage of choice, and tea and coffee are fine too. And uh, the grain should be whole grains. It should be healthy protein sources, and we spell that out. And we took uh, potatoes out of the vegetable group, and we uh, gave, gave some guidance about healthy fats in the diet too. And I know people here are very involved in physical activity, and we put a little reminder down there in the bottom about that too. It absolutely is important to, uh, since our daily lives do not automatically have physical activity, we need to consciously build activity into our daily lives. So that's a quick view over a lot of topics. And if you want to read some more about some of these, uh, the one at the left is a textbook. Unless you want to do that research, you may want to look at the book Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy. That's the one that was on sale out there. And also, with Molly Katzen, uh, I wrote a book called Eat, Drink, and Way Less, which focuses more on weight control. And Molly gave some great recipes, and there's some uh, very practical guides, more or less on the behavioral aspects of how do you stick to uh, a better way of eating. And I apologize for that brazen commercial. If you buy these books, there is no money back guarantee. But I do guarantee that each book contains 80 grams of fiber. And if you, um, 
get out your food processor and, and find the books aren't worth the paper they're printed on and you can run them through the food processor and uh, with some fresh uh, basil and olive oil. They're, they're really not too bad. Thank you. So Chris tells me we have time for a few questions. So uh, um, if any, or rebuttals or anything, you're uh, welcome. <laughs> Yes. Thinking about the combining of like fruits and vegetables at the same point in time, do they affect one another's digestive digestion? Uh, pro the question is, what about combining fruits and vegetables at the same time? Uh, and do that, does that affect digestion? I don't think it really makes too much difference. Uh, there, I know there's some popular diets that uh, try to keep things separate, uh, but in general, uh, we have a. a metabolic machinery for processing carbohydrates, a metabolic machinery for processing fats, and if we overload that machinery by having a large amount of just one of those at a time, then we get more buildup in the blood of fatty acids or, or blood glucose, which that's not so good. So in general, it is, there's, from a metabolic standpoint, it is desirable to space things out over the day and not just have all of one thing at a time, but have more variety uh, combinations throughout the day, just in a very general way. Uh, that does look like a better eating pattern. And one part of eating pattern that's not so great, it's, it's really what our culture emphasizes though, is having a really big meal at nighttime. And what is, that is adverse because uh, then we often flop down in front of a television set or go to bed. And uh, that then we don't get physical activity. If we have even uh, walking for half an hour, that'll help clear our blood of the glucose and fatty acids. So those, they'll be floating around all night long doing some nasty things around our body in, in terms of the lining of the arteries. So um, that, that's actually a pretty bad um, pattern of eating. Yes. Yeah, the question was, what about diets for athletes and particularly vigorous athletes? Um, unless people are really doing high and prolonged intensity kind of activities, uh, probably this is still the best kind of diet to be going on. But uh, if you're really, yeah, well, there's one day of the year, um, my friends and I do a crazy thing. We ride to Cape province on Cape Cod, that's 150 miles in a day. And that one day, I have to eat exactly the opposite of everything I told you, uh, because you really do need a constant stream of readily available carbohydrate. And you burn about 7,000 calories. In fact, we did a seminar on that, uh, was how to eat 7,000 calories a day and not gain weight. But people were disappointed when they learned you had to do that bike ride every day. But, uh, um, but if you try to eat this healthy diet, 7,000 calories of this diet, I did that once and felt just horrible the whole time because you're getting all this fiber and you, you just can't digest it all, uh, adequately. So it is, if you're really intensively exercising, burning you know, thousands of extra calories, then you can definitely need more toward the higher glycemic carbohydrates. But if you stop exercising for even a day, you need to switch back to a healthier diet because the adverse metabolic responses uh, come back just immediately. Yes. Right. Yeah. Sort of the question is for postmenopausal breast cancer. What about fat in the diet and weight and, and inflammation? How do those interrelate? And uh, what is quite clear is that. Uh, for both premenopausal and postmenopausal uh, women, we don't see oh, total fat is not related to breast cancer, percentage of calories and fat. But for postmenopausal women, uh, overweight and particularly weight gain after age 18 is, is related to higher risk of breast cancer. And almost for sure, a large part of it is due to the higher estrogen levels because the women who are obese have about three times the circulating levels of estrogen compared to a lean woman. There may be some additional role of inflammation which comes along with the overweight, but it's probably a large part of that, and probably most of it is mediated by the high estrogen levels. Uh, now, interestingly, if women 
take and continue to take hormone replacement therapy, then they get a big boost in estrogen levels from the pill, and so the body estrogen levels don't continue to add on top of that. Uh, so they're at higher risk of breast cancer uh, if they continue to take uh, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, so there's, there's a, that adds another layer of complexity, but women not on hormone pla replacement therapy. Uh, and j the basic point is keeping weight as close as possible to what people... Someone was clearly anorectic or something. Japan do maintain their weight. It, in fact, on average, they lose weight after age 18 slightly, which makes sense because you're lo losing a little bit of lean body mass as we get older. So uh, that's an interesting topic in itself. How do they manage to do that? But uh, it's, it's not impossible. But, and that really should be a goal. Even if you can't keep totally exactly that weight, it's a good guideline trying to stay as close as possible to what we weighed at about 18. One more question, I'm told. Right, yes, that was done in the Physician's Health Study, and uh, it was a randomized trial. It was interesting in several ways. It did show, this was a trial, a randomized trial of multiple vitamins. It showed an 8% reduction in total cancer incidence uh, after about 13 years of follow-up. And it's interesting in two ways. One is that we had, the, the biggest benefit was for colorectal cancer, which we had also reported in our cohort, in our observational studies as well. Uh, and we saw that in our, we reported earlier, you don't start to see much benefit till after 10 or 12 years in, of, of taking the multiple vitamins. It's probably uh, preventing some DNA damage early on in the process, and uh, the reduction in risk doesn't start till quite a bit later. And that's what was seen in the Physician's Health Study, too. If they had stopped that study at 10 years, there would not have been a, any a significant uh, result from it. And that's a bit sobering because that's the only study that's ever lasted that long, that you can sort of throw out the rest of the world's literature on uh, uh, randomized trials on vitamin supplements if you're looking for cancer reduction. It, it just, they just haven't gone long enough. Uh, it, the other uh, part of that study that was interesting was that this group of physicians probably has the best diet of any population in the world. We measured their blood carotenoids. They were way up there. This is really a health conscious bunch of physicians. And the fact that even in this very health conscious group, there was still some benefit of the multiple vitamins is actually pretty remarkable. There was just a report this week that in the same study that heart disease rates were not reduced by the, by the multiple vitamin uh, use. But I think that doesn't negate the fact or the likelihood that there still may be some benefit in uh, populations that are, do not have such good diets. I mean, this is probably the, you know, the 95th percentile of diets in the country. Other people have looked at multiple vitamins and heart disease risk, and in the part, they subdivided the population, and those that had less good diets, which is a huge part of the American population, uh, in that subgroup they did see lower risk of heart disease. So a couple interesting um, findings from that study, but uh, they have ramifications for research way beyond uh, that specific finding. Okay, well thank you.